Winton Valentine. So Winton was born in Fairley in 1928 and lived with his family at Burke's Pass until 1944. So his parents established and owned the Burke's Pass store that was largely operated by Winton's mother, Doris. His father had other employment, mustering, fencing, working at the Burke's Pass sawmill, and in 1944, Winton's parents sold the store to the McCarthy family and planned to move to Geraldine. Tragically, Winton's father was killed on his last day of employment at the sawmill, but Winton and his sister continued with their education and I think Winton eventually became an accountant. He describes his early family association with Burke's Pass, the store, its layout and goods. He recalls his school days, uh, memories of his parents, the loss of his father, and reflection on his years living at Burke's Pass. The shop that my mother and father started uh, is they started it themselves from nothing. They converted it a blacksmith shop, which apparently went out of business, or they might have bought him out. And in that blacksmith shop, they can turn it into a storekeeper shop. And what year are we talking about, Winston? Uh, it would have to be 1921 or something like that. Because they'd married in 1920. Yeah. Yes. So how would they get started? I mean, how would you even sort of finance yourself into a shop from nothing? I would not know. I think well, from my experience with, with, with my mother particularly in her later years, she was a very canny lady and I think she might have saved a few but I don't know how she'd save it being a nanny and I don't know how my father would have saved because in his day as a muster, I, I do remember it, the wage in those days was half a crown an hour, which is equivalent of 30 cents today. He worked for a pound a day and five pounds a week. That was his wage. And apparently that was quite a good wage, a pound a day and a five pound a week. So I think they must have just uh, had a couple of bob somewhere. There was no, there was no money in the Valentine family as such that I know of. Well, I've never found any since anyway. So so they weren't part of any sort of a franchise like you would get these days, you know, you get four no, squares and... Not that I, not that, no, there was nothing like that in existence. Right, so yeah. they just started, it was just it, their business? Just, just started it, Okay. Yeah. Well, today I suppose you'd call it a general store. It was almost everything from a needle to a, an anchor or a haystack, no, needle to an, a, a needle to a anchor, isn't it? Almost. But no, we had, we had just about everything. We had a whole range of, a whole range of groceries, a whole range of clothing, um, fairly comprehensive range of medicines and things. Um, uh, and that's about it. Just what, everything you sort of come across. You know, so, how big an area? Just you showed me the photograph of the outside of the house, and just go in. What, what, was it a just one room, or how was it? It was only one room, and uh, it was probably only twenty feet by twenty feet. Or the original blacksmith shop floor level was at ground level. When we come over here into the house they built, it was up perhaps three feet up off the ground at the front. But the back of the shop went back down onto ground level again. So from the back of the shop, we went down three steps into the kitchen area of the house. She was quite canny with her mother, money, my mother. But no, her money, I've still got the wee tin box, which I would show you. That she used to keep her notes in all the folding money, the paper money. And in those days, it used to be pounds denominations, and there was a five pound note, there was a ten shilling note, a one pound note, five pound note, a ten pound note, and then there was bigger denominations as well 
that the five and the ten were notes were very similar color a deep purpley blue color and just so she never made a mistake of giving one way in change when it should have been the other she used to fold the notes up and tie them one and tied into a little bow the ten pound notes which didn't get used as much as the five so she never made a mistake of giving the wrong change out and she used to keep that to keep all her money all her paper money in this little tin box which she used to keep in the kitchen up the top shelf of the drying cupboard. So to get the petrol from the from the underground tanks into the into the pump itself, how how did that happen? Well, the drums came up from the railhead fairly by the carrier, um, and generally the carrier's job was not complete until he had em emptied the the drums into the tank. But sometimes the tank might have been full and there would have been a drum left over and there was a stand which we put the drums on at truck height out the front of the in the corner of the front section and then we would have to empty that ourselves but the, you emptied it only by dropping the drum onto the ground putting a wee bung in one, at the end funnel telling everyone to stand, stand back because there's fumes all over the place and you just did that yourself and you right. usually did it after tea at night when there was no one around. I was interested in the in the stone trough which is now in Burke's Pass, the horse trough. What, was it around, was it part of this particular blacksmith do you think? It, it may have been but it originally in our days when we used to vandalise it by carving our names on it and everything else and actually chopping it with axes and sawing it with saws vandals uh, it was in the paddock next door did you have school concerts at the end of the year would you have a break up or something yeah we always had a concert and that was always craig parker was good on that because he was a good pianist uh, and he, he he used to organize a good concert uh, we had a at one end of the room would school would be screened off we had a, a big paper surround which marked off the, the stage. We had Burke's Pass School painted across the top of it. We had curtains which pulled by strings. We could raise the curtain to lower the curtain. Was this all in the school? The, no, end, there was no hall, was there? No, no, just one end of the school. Yep. All the desks would just be pushed back. I think he might have built the first electric fence in New Zealand on the back of Annette's property. Annette's being a, down at Airy Station, um, two or three miles down the road from Burke's Pass. There used to be a Maori track from the Arathanua Pass used to run up through Fairley, past Airy Station, um, up through the Mackenzie Pass, because in those days, Maori days, the Burke's Pass was never used. But, but Mackenzie Pass was the way into the Mackenzie country. And that's where Mackenzie the sheep stealer went. And that's where it got its name from. But the Maoris used that a lot. They used to travel right through the west coast to the Greenstone country through that same track. But Mr. Annett, who owned Erie Station, wanted this fence put up. Dad got the job. Mr. Annett was quite an inventive man, and he had developed his own little hydro power station at his house at Erie Station. And it used to flood the water down through the system at night, and you had electric light in the house until the dam ran dry when the dam ran dry there was no more water and the lights went out but that usually got them through the night and the dam would fill up next day and, and on the process went well he he built one of his little health and wheels in a creek out the back of Burke's off Erie station on the Mary track and they put up three or four miles of fencing and dad did that um and he used to, as he used to do, he used to walk everywhere. But he'd walk, walk to his to his job, and then come home at night. And I used to walk out quite often and meet him on the way home. Sometimes I'd get all the way, see what he'd done today. But sometimes I'd just meet him on the way. But it used to be a habit in those days, even when he was, when he was working at the sawmill down below. Well, it's just at dawn, and he'd be coming home, and in his truck, he'd still walk down the road, just to meet him on the way home. Did he not have a horse? No.
Right. No. Even when he was mustering, he'd always walk. No, he always walk. And I met a fellow in the hotel at Harriet one day, um, and there was only him and I in the pub. Well, he was in there first, <laughs> and uh, so we just got to chatting, and uh, and uh, he wanted to know who I was and where I came from. And I told him, he said, "Oh, Valentine," he says. You wouldn't know Alec Ballantyne. I said, oh, yes, he'd be my father. Oh, goodness gracious, he said. Um, he he used to muster. I used to muster together. And I mustered with him for many years. And he knew more about my father than I did. Nice old fellow, but he's he's not with us anymore either. But No, he told me the story then, which I'd never heard before, but he said, no, your dad could outwalk a horse. And 